G'day, g'day, and welcome back to another episode of The Experience with your host, Bradley J. Driver. We're here in the booth, the home of The Experience, the HQ. God, it's good to be back. It's always good to be back for a face-to-face. The energy's always a little bit better in the room than when you're across the, the laptop on Zoom. And today we're here to talk about a topic that I think across the board is pretty well researched. It's, you know, there's plenty of myths. I know that for sure. There's plenty of Things that go out there that aren't necessarily true. That's right, Nan. I'm pointing my finger at you. I ate all my crust growing up. My hair never got curly. You're a liar. <laughs> um, and yeah, that's that topic, nutrition. That that big word that is so broad and so wide that so many of us have a stab at it and just get it wrong. So today we're here to not only bust some of those myths and address some of the rumors, but to talk about what you can be doing in your day-to-day life, whether you are an athlete searching for peak performance or just an everyday human being who likes to wake up and feel great and go to bed feeling even better. And to do that, I've decided to get in a man who knows well a whole lot more than most. He's a qualified nutritionist, as well as that he's an endurance athlete, a guy who performs at an elite level on a consistent basis. And we're sat here in the studio on a Friday night over two kombuchas and a couple of organic (laughs) red grapes. That's right, organic red grapes. Because he's racing tomorrow, so ladies and gentlemen, from your home, your car, or wherever you are, give a very warm welcome to Mick Chapo Chapman. How are you, brother? Good, mate. That was a uh, solid intro. I don't know if I can live up to that. Mate, the, <laughs> uh, you know, the freestyle intros just roll from the top. Sometimes they're great. How good. Sometimes they just miss. So yeah, yeah. It's part of the business. But hey, pleasure to have you here. You've driven down from Sydney, and mate, it's just great to have you in the studio. You know, we connected over sort of the back end of last year as I was preparing for my little event. And yeah. It's been cool to see you do your thing and you're aligned with a lot of great athletes. I've seen recently, actually just was it last night or the night before, um, an ex-guest of the podcast, Corey or CosFit, as some of you may know him, um, completed the World's Strongest Marathon and and got a world record for pulling a 1.5 ton car. I believe you were some of the genius behind that nutrition and... Yeah, I had a a good chat with him um, early on, but um, yeah, he's, he's a great dude and I guess... I guess the space that you're in and the space that I'm in is is uh, having the ability to to see mates and see see people thrive at what they do. That might be a little bit different to what you do, but um, I, th- I think it's a term. I mean, I, w- I watched a um, doco not long ago on it in, in regards to I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but it's Ubuntu. So it's like whatever you're currently doing, I can thrive off of that. I don't have to compete with what you're doing. What you're doing with this, what I'm doing in a nutrition space. It's it's uh, it's great to get around people that are doing big things. So um, I, d- I just love that world, man, where people yeah. push each other. And I mean, I was out there watching um, Corey do his thing the other night, and it just feed some hunger inside you to um, to kind of figure out what what your next thing is as well. So it's it's unreal. It's a great world. It does, doesn't it? And it's you know, it's funny because obviously since coming across you on social, I've started to put a lot of links together. And a guy that I spoke about a heap in the lead up to my marathon because it was huge inspiration off it was Ned Brockman. Yeah. And I was watching, I don't even know how, I think I come across Ned's journey through another mutual friend of ours, Hannah Leonard. Yeah. And I seen Hannah had done a few runs with Ned and I'm watching him and I actually listened to him on a podcast two days before I ran my race. Yeah. Because I just thought, I just want to see what this guy's mentality and mindset was like stepping into the unknown, which I was too. And there's just been so many links. So like I said, it's great to have you finally here in person. And today, I, you know, I know personally for me, used to be a PT back in the day. By no stretch of the word was I anywhere near an expert of nutrition. Um, I think we all know basic principles of healthy eating, right? And we, yeah. we'd like to think we probably know more than we do. But it's something that was ever so important for me last year. And mm. When you're starting to really push yourself, you notice when you're getting things right when you're not. Mm. So I guess let's bust some of the myths around nutrition for anyone who's tuning in via listening or watching. And I think the big one is most people just want to feel a little bit better about the the belly, about the belly weight they're carrying, just the body weight in general, and want to feel more in control of it. Mm. And I know for me personally, as someone who has a, a range of weird health things going on, um, sometimes that's not always felt as clear as the as the general consensus. But most of the time, it is. Yeah. Let's talk about the basics when it comes to weight loss and yeah. burning fat. So I guess there's underlying principles to weight loss. I guess and and 
regardless of, of what that title is or, or who's selling what product, um, there's always an underlying theme to why those work, right? So, sure. um, and I mean, probably people have seen it a lot over, over social media um, more recently is, is talking about kind of calorie deficit and everyone's um, getting around that term now, which is kind of good. Um, I don't mind how certain things come about uh if, if they provide more meaning or more understanding for people so i guess um that's the most basic scientific um equation you can have is is energy in versus energy out but what that looks like in people's lives is so so different and people have so much um going on in their lives where you know it's it's not as easy as saying oh we'll just go out there for another run or just go out there and buy you know organic fruit and veg it's like not everyone has those opportunities to do that so it's trying to figure out what that looks like for you in your lifestyle yep. um and i guess yeah in, in terms of in terms of basic um principles uh, th there's always going to be th there's always going to be a diet out there right there's always going to be someone trying to sell something to, for financial gain and uh i guess understanding or, or recognizing those um those kind of pitfalls i guess um so you aren't forking out money um, left right and center and going i'm still confused i still feel guilty about food and i'm not getting anywhere um i mean certain things work for certain people and and if it is working for you then play on do that thing uh but just under, understand the underlying principles of of why those things work so i guess um the fundamentals to nutrition is is um kind of fruit and veg fruit and veg intake um getting getting your fiber in getting protein across the day is really really important yeah. as well um water intake um i heard a, heard a quote not long ago that was really really cool that that fiber um fiber in your diet which not a lot of people talk about but you, you need quite a fair bit of, i think it's for females roughly 25 grams a day for males roughly 30 grams a day of fiber yeah. and we don't no one talks about it it's not a buzzword it's not nothing but fiber is is really important but the, the, the kind of the quote or the, the reference that I got for fiber was that fiber's like the, the cement bag, you know, that, that sandy material, and uh, it goes really well as then a concrete with water as well. So fiber okay. is that, is that um, soft concrete um, or, the, or the powdered concrete, and then you add your water. So fiber and water is really good for our digestive um, health as well. So there's basic principles to why weight loss works or ma weight maintenance works. and uh, yeah, regardless of what it's called, they're, they're the reasons that it, that it does work. Um, and I guess my advice on that is is um, look at look at what the ulterior motives are potentially of, of, of who is who you're talking to in that space. If if someone's giving you um, pretty decent nutritional advice, um, you know, off the back of no financial gain, uh, which is the whole reason that I started this was to, to open up more conversations in, in the nutrition space to um, give people ownership about what that what they do with their with their food choices. But if there is a if you can see that there's an underlying financial gain to supplementation and things like that, it's probably the wrong area, or or you might find that that confuses you more in that space. Um, so go back to basics, right? Um, and I, I mean, I was speaking about this concept to um, on another podcast uh, earlier this week, and I guess that's a bit of podcast inception. Uh, <laughs> it's but, funny because I listened to that this morning. Yeah, right. And I yeah. sort of heard you talking about this time, and that's yeah. what I wanted to ask because I thought you explained it really well. Yeah. So, and, and I guess in terms of all the all the advice that's out there, and, and it is there is so much information in that space. Uh, I mean. The, the latest research, I think it was 2017, that there was quite a mass research on the uh, Australia-wide level was that 92% of Australians aren't getting five serves of vegetables a day. And it's like, if we're not ticking that box first, and then we're going, well, you know, how can I get this and how can I bring this into it? We're, we're missing the mark, right? So yeah. you've got to focus on those fundamentals before you do anything else. Um, and that would be my first point of call for anyone, really. Yeah. Yeah, it's really good to hear that. And I think it's something that's quite often overlooked, right? Yeah. Because in a world of, fat, like you said, fad diets, and there's always a new diet on the scene, there's always a new supplement that you can take that will enhance your body's ability to burn yeah. fat or enhance your body's ability to recover and put on muscle. It's really easy to look past just the basic stuff. And even I'm guilty of that. Yeah, and I think everyone is at some stage. I mean, I probably bought into stuff when I was a bit younger before I started my degree, where you kind of go, oh, this is going to help me out, either performance-based or or kind of you know day to day or i'm going to get to this point quicker by eating this or that um and i mean 
again, the first point of call is going straight to the source, um, which is kind of nutritionist, dietitian, um, those, those kind of people, e- even your doctor if you're having pro- you know, some, some proper um, health issues. And, and I mean, I, I know where my uh, limit is, right? So if people come to me with certain things that are quite full on, um, I'll refer them up. Um, so it's, I, I know where my space is and I know where to stop as yeah. well so I think that's really important and, and you, you talk about being a PT in, in a previous role it's like I, I used to be a PT down in Wollongong here as well um, love the gong and you know spent a good 10 to 12 years here um, but it's just understanding where your where your knowledge base is right and, and, yeah. and stopping when, when you know that you're probably getting to a point where you're like oh I don't have a great deal of depth can you talk about a certain topic for more than say two minutes continuously um, if that's a no, it's probably not your space um, and you need to refer that up. So uh, a good analogy there and one that I've used plenty of times before is that uh, you know, just because someone is a frequent flyer, it doesn't mean they can fly the plane. So yeah, like you know, if, if, if someone's, uh, you know someone's got a Qantas frequent flyer point, you wouldn't go, oh yeah, no, you jump up and you, know, you take this one this time yeah. and, and you fly the plane this time. You wouldn't do that. So, so why do we do that for nutrition advice? So, um, and, and, and it is hard, it's, it's an unregulated space to some degree. Um, nutrition science is a, is a bit of a muddy science. You, it's really hard to uh, put, put point A to point B as causation. That's quite tricky sometimes, especially with the m- myriad of kind of variation that we have in our lifestyle. So it's really hard to, to put one thing to another. Um, and then, yeah, as I said, it's unregulated and people have a vested interest in it, right? We eat, we eat it all, all, every day. It's like everyone's got a vested interest and, and it's personal. Food is personal to people um, in terms of their lifestyle, their culture. So I guess if things work for you, this is probably my best piece of advice. If things work for you, keep doing that. Um, don't feel that you need to fill a space of nutrition advice to other people because it has worked for you um yeah so and and there is a lot of people out there doing that um i mean i I really don't care what people eat it's it has no effect on who i am or what i do but when when that when that health advice starts to become detrimental to a big population that's what really bugs me 100 percent. i've got a big question something that you know touches on what we spoke there about that calorie deficit which seems to be the the buzz topic at the moment and you know, I think it's for good and bad reason. Personally, if I look at it, I think good reason because it is a simple science. I worry that in a world where we want to believe, you know, we want to believe that the easiest option mm. is the right option and the best option, right? So mm. one thing I've always wondered, and, and I fell into this trap for a while there, is where I was trying to cut down some body fat when I was a little bit younger and I was just training in the gym. I'm also trying to look good for summer. You know, the case. yeah, it is, isn't it? And it's a constant battle. It's a constant battle at the time. And as someone who has, you know, my family comes from a long line of, of drivers who love sweets. Yeah, yeah. And just love getting stuck into some junk food. Yeah. Funnily enough, we all manage to keep relatively fit, but we love a bit of junk food. And yeah. probably was always trying to squeeze, you know, that typical if it fits your macros type of diet mm. to squeeze those things into the diet. Do you think there's potentially a negative? relationship that can be built with food off the back of that yeah definitely and and there are a lot of uh you know probably people don't see it as regularly but there are a lot of um food related issues or health issues um even you know mental health issues that come off the back of food as i said we do we do eat it um quite regularly and i mean if you've got a a poor uh relationship with the food that you're having you're going to have those battles in your head every single day and, um, and hopefully, uh, you know, myself and, and a few people that, that kind of I follow or I, you know, share their stuff, it's, it's hopefully giving people ownership back on, on their health and, and um, reducing a lot of that guilt that is around those kind of things because we shouldn't need to regulate um, everything, right? And, and uh, I always use a concept that's like, if you're standing on the edge of a cliff and someone goes, don't look down, the first thing you're going to do is look down. So it's like, if, if I tell you now, don't, you know, you're not allowed to eat a burger for the next four weeks, what's the first thing you're going to do when you, when you, you want a burger? So, so it's, it's about that healthy relationship with food and, and allowing yourself those times to enjoy food. Food should be enjoyed with, um, you know, friends, family, things like that. It brings us together and we should allow that to happen. And, if that includes, um, you know, eating out and and not as a nutrition nutritious meal, 
that's completely fine. That's what food's for. But it's about uh, keeping, I guess, consistent food habits throughout your life. If, you, if you're eating those kind of um, energy-dense, nutrient-poor foods quite regularly, that's when you kind of um, run into those issues, which a lot of people do know that. Um, but, yeah, it's just about... It's just about understanding your relationship with food and and everyone can question that. And they can say, you know, do I have a healthy relationship with food? Do I enjoy it when I, you know, when I have a, a few uh, a few meals that are a little bit different to what I usually have? It's completely fine. Um, there's no issue with that. And that's probably a healthier way of looking at food, that everything's available. Just reduce the stuff that's probably energy dense, nutrient poor more frequently, yeah. One thing I love that I, I actually heard on that podcast that you've just recently been on, was it, what was the name of that again? The uh, Running Matters, so that was a bit more, yeah, performance based, so yeah, yeah good well, deals up there. I think it might have been that one, was it The Girls? Oh, The Girls was uh, the girls was a Stronger Stride, yeah. Stronger Stride, I listened to that too, yep. and I found one thing I really liked that you said is you broke down how an individual burns calories throughout the day. Yeah. And you spoke about, I think it was, you used the five percent is the rough figure yeah of what your calorie burn actually comes from exercise and you broke down how the rest of that happens mm. it's something that probably a lot of people are uneducated on yeah and i think the biggest uh the biggest showing of of that and it's, it's called um total daily energy expenditure so it's how our body um burns fuel right and and this happens to everyone regardless of how active you are regardless of how inactive you are um is that, and, and the biggest, as I said, the biggest show of that, or the biggest show of, of how different our, uh, our calorie burning capacity was, was when COVID hit. Um, people still may have been going to the gym for that hour a day, and, or you know, potentially doing those things at home, still doing those things, still lifting weights, still doing body weight exercise, and potentially putting kilos on, and they're like, after a couple of months, they're like, what is happening here? And as I said, yeah, that five to 10% is, uh, that that exercise period, um, what we don't account for or don't realize as much, and this is what what comes under kind of I guess my public health hat or my the public health kind of realm that I that I work in is is that non exercise activity thermogenesis. So that's what's called. It's called NEAT. Um, so that is that activity. You know, you're eating a grape now. So it's that it's that kind of um, it's all that incidental movement that we do uh, that creates more movement throughout the day and and i guess that's why that um you know uh, ten thousand steps is a, is a good measurement throughout the day because that just you know you, you it's rare that unless you're a long distance runner or do do it quite often it's rare that you're going to get ten thousand steps per day um just based off one exercise activity right so ten thousand yeah. steps is you walking down the stairs to grab a coffee coming back up all that sort of stuff so that's your neat and that accounts for a lot more um, than our exercise activity usually does. So, okay. so I guess if you're, you know, if you think that you're, if weight loss is your goal, and I mean, it doesn't have to be everyone's goal, weight maintenance is completely fine space to be in. I think our culture is, is too focused on weight loss. Um, I mean, we do have, uh, I think it's 70, no, 67% of Australians are above a healthy weight. So, I mean, it is an issue for Aussies, but I mean, if you're, if you're happy and strong and, and fit, then, you don't need to lose weight if you feel comfortable in yourself so um but yeah so that's that's one thing that you can really target if if, if weight loss is your thing to go um you know how can i move a little bit more throughout the day without necessarily having to go to the gym or having to go for a run and, yeah. and it's easy to do i feel like i've noticed that especially in maybe it's just this area or just the community that i'm in particular I notice a lot of people who are starting to get into a journey of getting fitter getting healthier whether it's weight maintenance or weight loss or even weight gain in some cases mm -hmm. there's this push around got my 10,000 steps in today or yeah. got my and it's it's good to see because like you said it's for me I've noticed my life's changed probably a lot in the last year or two and I think mm. probably just comes off the back of being the fittest I have been where you naturally are I think when you when you're your fittest and your healthiest you're naturally more inclined to just go and walk down for a coffee instead of getting yeah. in the car or yeah, or exactly. to go walk around town and I find I walk up here to the studio, I yeah. walk home. Yeah. Might be that extra like 2,000 steps you get a day that, yeah. like you said, it all adds up. And you also spoke about basal metabolic rate, which is yeah. your body's yeah. calorie burn whilst at rest just yeah. to keep your organs yeah, healthy so that, and functional. Yeah, so that accounts for, uh, I think this is correct, uh, 70 to 75% of our daily calories that are burnt. 
Yeah. People have no idea about that. That's that's just our vital organs functioning day to day without us getting out of bed. Um, yeah. So our base metabolic rate is is um, you know it's quite important and and that's what keeps us going day to day. Um, but but what we can actually um, influence is the non-exercise activity thermogenesis movement, incidental movement, and our ec- exercise activity thermogenesis. So um, our exercise. So yeah, gym, whatever you do games of soccer whatever it is yeah i've got a question something that i'm quite intrigued about let's say for example we we know exactly through science that a certain individual but needs to burn two and a half thousand calories a day because of their their output or their intake Mm -hmm. and they're exactly on that mark they're doing everything right as far as calories in calories out Mm -hmm. Is there a case in where the food they're eating and the relationship that has with their hormones, blood sugar levels, insulin, all those sort of things can change that science? Uh, hard, yeah, hard to unpack, but short answer is kind of no. It's, uh, if, I mean, if we could isolate all of that in terms of calories in, calories out, and, and you should be, yeah, your weight maintenance is you know, two and a half thousand calories and, and you're or ticking that out off throughout the day. Uh, I think I would say that our metabolism and hormones, they they get a lot of... Uh, Sorry about that. They're filming Fast and the Furious, <laughs> 25 <laughs> out on the street. Seen them all. Seen them yeah. all. I think Paul Walker's back in that one. Yeah, <laughs> that's actually the only car scene. That's the only car scene in the whole movie. The rest is fighting and guns. How good's Paul? Um, oh, so good. Um... What was I saying? I don't know. Um, we're talking about that <laughs> calorie burn in the relationship. Yeah, yeah. So I would say that yeah, metabolism, um, metabolism and hormones. I guess it's a really good scapegoat for people to go. Oh, okay. well, it's out. You know, um, if you're having proper issues with your hormones um, or metabolism, things like that, it's like it's probably you need to go and see an endocrinologist or like a, a, yeah. a doctor, right? Or or a accredited dietitian. So, um, but it does get a raw deal. I'd say, um, as I said before, there's 92% of Australians aren't getting their vegetable intake. And then we go, well, my metabolism throw, yeah. get thrown out, you know. So um, as a rough rule, our metabolism, uh, it, it slows down approximately 1% to 2% per 10 years of our lifestyle. So it gets the rawest deal for something that doesn't yeah. have a major effect. And uh, what I'd say there is most people probably... Uh, underestimate the amount of calories that they're taking in yeah. and they're overestimating the amount of output that they're having in terms of exercise or movement, valuing movement. Yeah. So um, that's probably where it lies a little bit. So does that mean that when our parents tell us they're not as fit as they used to be because... Just an excuse. Yeah, <laughs> Age is a number. I've been telling the old boy I'm coming for him. Um, one thing that I found and probably it's been the hardest thing for me to wrap my head around with nutrition in the past particularly three months was I had... I reckon I found for majority of my adult life, I was always, I always struggled to really regulate my weight because I'm a big eater. I love my food, right? Yeah. And I can easily, if you said to me, Brad, go pack away 5,000 calories today, Damn. I'd laugh at you and do it in, yeah. no, like in no time. <laughs> yeah. And I can just naturally eat. I can fill myself up. I love to feel full. Yeah. And I have no trouble getting calories in. The minute I started training last year for the mm. marathon, I lost 12 kilos in that yeah, right. prep. So I went from 88 to 76 kilos. Yeah. And the thing I found was I was eating more than ever. Yeah. But obviously my energy expenditure Output, was yeah. huge, right? And like for me, the first time I've ever burnt that many calories or yeah. done really that much intense exercise mm. in a long time. And post-event, I found myself so comfortable with eating what was probably you know, around three and a half thousand calories, mm. you know, guesstimating and sort of rough. Not, I kind of know because I have to take digestive enzymes. Yeah, yeah, I eat. Right. yeah. So I kind of have a good idea of what I'm putting in my body. Yeah. The hardest thing for me has been post event. I'm not running 50 or 60 Ks a week yeah. anymore. So I've had to change my relationship with food where it's mm. not about just getting it in anymore. Yeah. It's about really thinking about how much of it I'm getting in and not being too excessive. Yeah, for sure. And it's a, it's a, 
I mean, that's 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 kind of the balance that we play with every day, right? And it's, yeah. um, people got to try and, you know, with, with some advice or some kind of guidance, um, once they've got that, then that's when they've got to try and figure it out themselves to some degree where they go, you know, this this works for me, I am a breakfast eater, I'm not. Um, you know, that, those kind of things all, all play into it. And uh, I think sometimes, as you said before, being really attuned to uh, your body does help. And, and I know, um, I guess... You know, being an athlete, you do have that kind of sixth sense to go, oh, something's off, or, you know, I need to be... You, you kind of get that vibe that you need to be either eating more or bringing it back. But um, I guess sometimes with that, when you do re- reduce it, um, your output significantly, sometimes your body responds to that and you're like, oh, I'm not, not that hungry or, I, you know, probably wouldn't even notice, but you probably don't eat as much um, calories in a lunch meal or something like that. But that's kind of sometimes um, what happens naturally. But then, yeah, there are other times where you go, um, you know, I, I've, I've been, uh, there's a lot of output happening and then you, you, you just strip that back and COVID yeah. is a perfect example of that. And you go, well, I'm still eating the same amount of stuff. So um, that, that's, as you said, it's probably that um, tapping into that mental side to go, okay, well, I need to... Um, monitor what, what I'm intaking. And that's probably one thing that I do enjoy about um, about diets. And, and I don't really like the word diet. I prefer like a bit of a lifestyle um, change or or more consistent change with, with people. So, um, but the thing that I do like about diets is as soon as someone say, says they're going on a diet, and this is one of the reasons that it works as well, is because they're conscious of what they're putting in their mouth. You, if yeah. you're not on a diet, you'll go, yep, yeah, eat that, eat that, eat that. When you're on a diet, in inverted commas, uh, you you go oh, okay well I'm on a diet now so I'll make sure I'm consuming that or consuming that you you're more conscious of that and what I would say to people is try and get off a diet but use those concepts in your day to day anyway to be conscious of what you're putting in your mouth. You know it's funny you say that because I found I reckon my best periods of maintaining my weight or feeling quite lean or looking lean is the byproduct of consciousness without almost without thought. Yeah. And I don't even know if that makes sense coming through the mic and, and on to you guys or maybe even to you. But what I'm talking about is I find that the more I go into, say, it's Monday, going to eat healthy this week. Yeah. Know what I'm having for brekkie, know what I'm having for lunch and dinner, and it's well thought out and well planned. The more I sit there all day thinking, fuck, I'm so hungry. Yeah, right. Because I think because eating is at the front of my mind. Yeah. You my body's just telling yeah, me to yeah. eat. Yeah, right. Where I find the less I think about it, yeah. and I feel like because I kind of know what I should be eating and shouldn't, yeah. Yeah. like if I had a day where I got up and had my usual peanut butter and poached eggs, Benny, and Benny Seymour. Benny Seymour special. <laughs> <laughs> he's throwing feta in it now. I don't know about that. I reckon he's taking it. He's got shares bit. or something in. <laughs> yeah, he's got shares in Mavis or Pix or something like that. Um, and then like if I went and had a burger and didn't think, oh, I shouldn't have had that. Yeah. Then the rest of the day kind of just flows better and I might just eat a little bit less naturally for dinner. I feel yeah. like for me, overthinking it yeah, yeah, really plays with it. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, you don't want to spend your whole day thinking about food um, or, or obsessing about food is probably something that I'd say. Not not saying that you did, but I'm just saying that, that a lot of people do get that kind of overwhelming f- feeling of like, oh, well, what's next and what, you know, and, and planning... I guess planning does help with that, and that's one thing that I'm terrible at, like yeah. planning out meals and, and things like that. But I mean, w- whatever works for people, right? And uh, uh, yeah, and in terms of that satiety that you touched on before, in terms of staying full or, or feeling hungry, um, if if people can get the simple concept of trying to tick off uh, protein across the day throughout your meals, and as well as fiber, so protein yeah. and fiber. If you're looking for foods that consistently have protein and fiber throughout the day, you're going to be less likely to go, oh my God, it's three o'clock and I need that giant sugar hit, right? So yeah. um, so just be wary of those snacks that you can, you know, fill up on a little bit easier um, through through those, yeah, through protein and fiber. It's a, it's a little, it's a tiny little trick that you can go, oh, well, I didn't have to have that, you know, block of chocolate because I had, you know, a handful of nuts or yeah. a bit of uh, high protein yogurt. Can I ask... With that, you know, I heard you speak about it on one of the two pods that I listened to and you spoke about the the volume of protein that is, I guess, necessary or almost absorbable in every meal to a degree. Yeah. Explain that a little bit because that's a concept I reckon probably a lot of people don't understand. Yeah, so I guess in terms of, and I would say a lot of people probably think 
you know, endurance athlete, carbohydrates, uh, uh, gym, gym goer, protein. So I, w- I, would, I would suggest that, um, I mean, all macronutrients are, are essential in, to some degree, but I would say even if you're not an in- endurance athlete, carbohydrates are still important. Even if you're not a gym goer, regular gym goer, protein is very important to whatever your, um, your goals are. And, and touching on that, uh, yeah, as, as, I've, as I've kind of previously mentioned in, in other podcasts, there's kind of an anabolic window and it's, it sounds a bit full on, um, but it, that's for everyone, right? It doesn't matter if you're trying to build muscle or not. And what that is, is what we want to try and get is, um, this is super rough, and, uh, but, but 20, 20 to 50 grams roughly is that anabol- anabolic threshold um, on either side of, of, of feeding. So we want to try and get 20, to 50, 20 grams to 50 grams of protein in uh, within a meal across the day. And it's so much more important to get it across the day than it is to uh, do your gym workout and then just smash all the protein that you've got in your little, you know, in yeah. your little scooper. So uh, that's more important. I would suggest people look acro- about, uh, look at protein intake across the day and, and space that out. Uh, and, and a more scientific kind of measure of it is uh, 1.6 to 2.2 grams per kilogram per day so look yeah. more towards that try and calculate that for your body weight um the, the 20 to 50 grams is just a real rough thing to to be looking at and i, I would say that the majority of people probably don't get their protein intake as high in their uh, breakfast meal is that because of just the the ready use of say like oats or cereals or yeah i guess so it's just um and it depends. Some people might not be getting any protein at all in their diet. With, uh, sorry, in that in that breakfast meal without even realizing. Yeah. Um, but some people might be ticking it off completely fine. But it's just being aware. As I said, it's just being aware of of getting those protein intakes throughout the day. Let's start to dive into the athletic pursuit now, and it's something you're obviously very passionate about. It's something I'm becoming and sort of became passionate about last year. Is pushing your body to those new limits, those limits you maybe haven't found yet, and figuring out what you're really capable of and one thing I was probably a little bit guilty of last year in my prep is no matter how much Benny was chirping in my ear about getting that food in which I'd done a really good job of Mm. post run as someone who was I guess trying to cut down a little bit of the dad rig that had found himself over a couple of years in a real estate office and from being a little bit lazy I probably wasn't eating enough around my training Mm -hmm. to perform yeah it was more so for me because i find that i don't like to eat too early in the morning and i really like to be faster when i run Mm -hmm. so i found that anytime i ran anything under 30 k's i just wouldn't eat yeah and i felt fine yeah but probably didn't perform my best in some of those 20s or those halfers yeah or even 15 k's where i could have utilized a little bit of fuel yeah but it was just because i was just like oh well i kind of don't feel like i need to and yeah you know i want to chip off a couple of calories and yeah. get that off to a good start before I get those big meals in. Yeah. But how important are those intra-workout meals through your training prep? Probably more so as you get closer to the race, right, to get your gut right and yeah. Know, yeah, for know sure. what you can handle. But also that post-workout window, Yeah. because we hear about it a lot in that gym scene, got to get your, your protein, yeah. your carbs in immediately after. Yeah. It's like within 30 seconds of you yeah, yeah, yeah. chugging down a shake, like yeah. you're losing gains. Yeah. How... Uh, let's talk about those myths or yeah. maybe truths around post training, but also intra workout. Yeah, so yeah, again, a lot, a lot to unpack there. But uh, I would say, in terms of endurance events, people probably don't train enough with their nutrition throughout their their training and and their long runs, uh, and then they'll you know jump into a race, maybe even you know try new things on race day and and wonder why they blew up and they'll mm. blame their training or they'll blame their legs or their endurance they're like i'm not fit enough and it's like you, you may have been you just um you just kind of cook the nutrition side of things so um just being aware of of kind of how that works um i mean there is a lot of um chat in the kind of keto space or the um training low space at the moment um i mean if you're an endurance athlete um i I wouldn't recommend going down that route um, yeah. if, if you want to be performing well. Um, Fuck, it's hard yeah. too. Isn't it? Yeah, and yeah, that's the other thing as well. It's, uh, I mean, ketogenesis is is actually our body. Um, you know, it's it's almost a survival mechanism, right? So when mm. carbohydrates are not available, our body goes, oh shit, 
um, you know, we need to figure out another fuel source and, and that's what it does. So, so that's what we would do naturally if we were kind of um, out in the wilderness for X amount of days. So um, it's a survival mechanism and we don't necessarily need to be in that. Um, I do appreciate people who've got their own things going on, but it is, as you said, it's super hard yeah. um, to, to keep up. And I think, you know, it's it's the rough rule for keto is, is kind of 50 grams. And if you have 50 grams of carbohydrates, you're automatically out of it. And then even if you have too much protein, that'll convert to glucose as well, won't it? Um, so protein works a little bit differently, but um, I guess in terms of, I guess in terms of the, what you were speaking about before about being fasted, I guess I'll touch on that as well. But uh, there's, there's a difference between, so say say you're fasted, you'll use fat oxidation throughout your run, say, yep. say you go for a run. And as you said before as well, it's a really good opportunity to, if you still get, if you still can enjoy that session and you get good quality out of that session, it's a good way to reduce calories because it's just reducing that uh, feeding window, I guess. Um, yeah. And that's the whole idea of those those timed meals or kind of intermittent fasting, I guess. And uh, But th- there's a difference between fat oxidation, which is what's happening in that s- space. So fat oxidation is actually using fat as a fuel source in our body during that run, Yeah. right? Um, that's different to burning fat, if that makes sense. That's yeah. different to losing body fat um, because the only way to do that, again, is coming back to that calorie deficit, right? So we, we fat oxidize in a, fast, uh, in a fasted run, but then as soon as we get, come back and have, have some fuel, get some fuel in, we, we convert more so to our carbohydrate fuel, all right? So that's kind of, I hope that that kind of explains... Um, that fasted cardio a little bit more. Um, it a lot of people use it, and I mean it's a great way. As I said, it's a great way to reduce that feeding window and, and reduce some calories potentially in the day. Um, my question to people is if your the quality of your session is reduced because of that, and and potentially even more so in a gym based setting, if you, the quality of your session is reduced because you fasted, try and get something in beforehand. Can I ask on that? So you speak about fat oxidize oxidization. Is that, like like you said, it's different to fat burn yeah. or burning, you know, losing weight. But just say, for example, you were coming in like you were quite sharp. So say someone in your condition who doesn't hold a lot of body fat is quite sharp. Is that relationship with fat oxidation going to be different? Um, potentially in terms of, I mean, it's the same pathways, right? But it's just, uh, it may work slightly differently in terms of numbers and things like that in, in, different, in different bodies. And I guess a, a good way to do it and back in the PT world was what I was what I used to say is you know the more muscle mass you have the more fat burning capacity you have as well so yeah. um, that's that's kind of the incentive that you talk to your clients about um, but I mean a thing that we probably don't speak about enough is genetics people go you know people look at people on Instagram and, and you know they might have pretty decent training somewhat of, of decent um, kind of nutrition intake and they've got great genetics and suddenly they get paid X amount of dollars to hold a product up next to them and, and people go, oh, well, that's the reason. That product is the only reason that person looks like that. It's not, not the case. So, um, I want to talk about genetics for a second. You know what I've seen? I did not know this until yesterday. Browsing through Instagram and I see a video pop up of this bloke who's, like, he's a good looking human too. <laughs> Jesus Christ, looks like he could have been a model. Fucking knocking some bloke into the next century yeah, in right. a boxing ring. <laughs> and it's not Anthony Joshua, is it? He's a, no, he's a, like he's a, he's a genetic <laughs> freak too. And then I look at the name and it's Tommy T. Fury. And I go, yeah, surely right. this bloke isn't related to Tyson Fury. He is. He looks like he's about seven foot five. Yeah, right. There was no fat on him. He was just a like machine. Absolute an machine. absolute machine. And I was like, how's that genetics? How's that happen? <laughs> what are they eating in the Fury family? Yeah. They're all seven foot tall. It was um, it was really interesting actually. Out at uh, coming back to to Corey's marathon, the the world's strongest marathon. I was out there the other day and I was, had a really fascinating chat with one of his mates that kind of helped him through his training, who's actually a strong man. And same thing, I looked at him. I was like, this dude is a unit, right? Yeah. And um. We just got discussing it. It's so fascinating. Regardless of what athlete you look at, him and I had this connection where we were just like, we, we're on the same page with stuff. But our sports were so, so different. And, it, yeah. and I guess that's the kind of the horses for courses, right? His frame was built for strongman. My frame is probably built for shorter, sharper stuff. So um, we kind of appreciated each other's space a little bit and yeah. realized that Corey, what he was doing with that world's strongest um, 
marathon pulling a you know 1.5 ton truck was he was sitting in the middle of both our worlds and i would have never met him if it wasn't for that event yeah. so it's just fascinating how athletes and i would say that just in terms of the way that our brains ticked it was very similar yeah it was really cool it's funny because when i spoke to Corey, we spoke about a guy who used to hold that record yeah not the last guy but the guy before him mr ross edgley yeah man he's a genetic freak of nature if you look yeah. at that guy like the yeah. way his body shifts and moves and he's able to to adjust for certain events sports yeah and pretty fascinating and huh? that's probably the that's probably the key because a lot of people look at um other people's goals and things and they go oh well, he's crushing that or he's crushing that and people um i mean you know try and find internal drive with that because internal drive is going to get you way further than trying to validate yourself externally right yeah but with with ross edgeley and and i guess uh benny seymour spoke a, lot, a bit about it on on your podcast is is um kind of that specificity like trying to get after a certain goal and and uh specifying your training towards that and and i guess one thing that people um didn't really realize about kind of ross edgeley and, and as you said he's a freak but he goes after certain things and goes after them hard in terms of his training um setup and uh, I was, I've read a couple of his books and, and he was speaking about his swim around Great Britain and that's what really spiked my interest in him. And he said, he said that, I mean, he was, during that stage, he was so strong in the water, right? He would have had yeah. to have been. But he said he couldn't even do a squat or a calf raise on the boat. Like his legs were jelly, complete jelly. So it comes back to that horses for courses. It's like, you'll never be your strongest in terms of lifting as well as your fastest in terms of a 5k time um so it's trying to figure out those events and really pushing yourself in those events at different stages because you're not going to do that back to back like month after month be the strongest and fittest you've ever been i mean you can you can be quite general and and yeah. i'd say um people like that are, are quite general in terms of their um their overall fitness but when you start to chase big goals you need to be specific how much of your year, like, obviously you, you probably get events that sporadically pop up and mm. it changes plans, but how much of your year is built around training for specificity and how much is just you waking up in the morning and going, hey, I just want to go for a run? Or yeah, a yeah. Yeah, it's really fascinating because I guess COVID changed all that and I would take, you know, that running world as, as an example that everyone had a really solid foundation of base training and then they're like well i need to specify in the next month otherwise i might not get a race in at all this year so yeah. it was really cool to go there weren't those um incremental races that people um were, were, were ticking off and it was just about that huge base layer of fitness and then and then specifying um kind of relatively uh, short notice so yeah it's kind of it's kind of fascinating in, in terms of yeah in terms of what i get after I, in terms of a year i'd probably make sure that i've got um three or four solid things that i'm working on and then uh kind of fill the gaps in between um, yeah. just to keep those short-term goals and and make sure that i'm i'm still hungry so um that's yeah that's usually how i work my calendar and i'll usually take a bit of a break here or there and enjoy myself for a little bit because uh, I, I enjoy coming back a little bit stronger or, or specifying to a different kind of uh, down a different route yeah yeah and most of that's what try or just run yeah at on? the moment at the moment i'm um just jumping back into a few tries just out of enjoyment mainly yeah. um and and i find when i uh enjoy training more and, and get after it I, I perform better as well when it's uh when it kind of you hit a lull you find that you you know you might get injured a little bit more or you're not as keen for races and things like that so i really enjoy stepping back and reassessing and go no this is now what i want to get after and um and push myself towards that yeah you may have a different opinion of this speaking individually but when we'd first sort of met i was chatting to chris powell oh yeah and Good dude. we were yeah <laughs> great dude and we we're talking about just running in general and sort of avoiding those injuries and and, and I think I was tossing up sort of what I wanted to do this year because I knew I was going to be running a marathon towards the back half of the year, but I didn't exactly know what I was going to be doing in between. And I wanted to obviously have a far greater base. It sounds like I've got a daycare going on in the back here at the moment too. <laughs> He's um, just picking up a few extra dollars here. And yeah, there, you know, exactly. So looking after some kids. Some kids just sitting here in the <laughs> studio watching live and free. Um, yeah, and I was sort of deciding what I wanted to do for the year and I was tossing around whether... Do I play with this sport? Do I yeah. jump in a CrossFit gym? Do I just get after some more weights in the gym myself and keep building the running? And mm. Chris said to me, he goes, 
just chat to Chapo about what he's doing <laughs> run-wise because he yeah. said, that guy seems like he stays pretty in- injury-free all the time. Yeah. Would you agree with that or disagree? Uh, I would say that, I mean, as, as you kind of get older, you need a little bit more maintenance in terms of that um, kind of recovery and, and uh, looking after yourself. But also, again, uh, coming back to internal, motiv- um, internal motivation or validation, um, getting out what you want. So, I mean, I don't look at other people and go, well, I need to be doing that, so I'll go out and run a marathon today because that person ran one yesterday. That's not what I get after. And I think because of that, um, to some degree, I do stay injury-free. Uh, I mean, that's uh, I have had plenty of injuries in the past, especially playing touch footy, you know, I've done shoulders and ankles and all sorts of things. Um, yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's hard to stay injury-free. And, and I would suggest in terms of, elite athletes not saying that i am it's uh, the he is uh, <laughs> if you take kind of the brownlee boys who are who were top yeah. top athletes you know that dad i don't is one of the leading cf doctors in london yeah right so yeah yeah brains yeah. as well <laughs> mm. so if you take those boys they were either performing at their best or they were out injured right so yeah. and, and and when you get the the higher you do get on that on that pecking order Again, that's that's not me, but it's um, once you get to that elite level, uh, you really need to be pushing your body to a point where you you're either performing at your best or or you're injured. And they they've got all the physios etc. in their corner, and they still couldn't stay um, kind of race ready because they were right on that limit. So it's tricky. It's really tricky, and and not even elite athletes with uh, all the people in their corner can can stave it off, you know, um, yeah. forever. So it's just about being smart I'd say it's probably more about being smart about training and getting after certain goals just to move back towards nutrition in peak performance one thing that I learned is kind of like we touched on before as my K's got bigger every week and as my load in, increased I was able to obviously still make sure I was hitting all of my daily like I'm a, I love my fruit and veg so it's never hard for me to get yeah. you know my fiber intake in my fruit and veg all my micronutrients but I found that whilst I still had good clean proteins and carbohydrates, there was kind of just more so a need as well just to get calories in, right? Yeah, man, yeah. Would you say that it's a mix of both or, or it moves in one direction, whereas you get more elite and your requirement for just fuel and recovery gets more important that the quality of the food yeah. that's necessary decreases or yeah it's it's again it's just that balance where you've got to try and figure it out yourself based on what your output is and and um benny seymour touched on this as well in terms of what what your nutrient intake is needs to match what you're outputting right and and i mean uh if if that is heavy loads and big 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 shifts um you know day in day out or, or on weekends where you know i used to do a fair bit of triathlon training through the national park and that that was some um that was some big days right so it was kind of five six hours on a bike so you do need to get that that Mm. fuel back in and and sometimes that can take many forms so i'd say that there's almost two trains of thought my my first and initial is always with a public health hat to say to suggest that um you know you need to get certain um certain food types in your diet right that's always my first point of call but then i mean there is a need to get energy um and it needs to match your your output and and sometimes that does look as you know quite quite energy dense um foods and i'd be the same sometimes man i mean i don't shy away from you know a bag of lollies or a pizza or whatever it's and, and again that comes back to that whole chat about um not feeling guilty about foods everything's on the table and and uh a good public health um, message is kind of don't don't reduce anything off the table in terms of what you eat add right so if you add more fruits and vegetables it's probably gonna it's probably gonna push that other stuff out right so yeah. i would say add more to um, add more nutrient dense foods to your diet and it's going to push that other stuff out rather than trying to restrict all the bad yeah. stuff right i really yeah i actually really like that hey yeah. i think it's a really good way of looking at it now i feel like most of the time probably where it happens on the opposite end of the spectrum is maybe this time relationship we've put around diets and food and challenges and the need to do it in 12 weeks, the need to do it in yeah. eight weeks. Yeah. Do you think those time constraints are really unhealthy ways of creating habits? I mean, they can be. And um, I know a couple of gyms that, that mates run at the moment are coming away from that kind of 
um, that challenge space or or even if they are doing that challenge space they're really trying to educate their their clients to um, implement these things throughout their life and and the thing that I always um, use is is that uh, one consistent change to your diet is going to trump uh, a two-week diet any day of the week right so if, if, yeah. if you're not going to be um, if it's not manageable in any in any way and um, I'd say a lot of people do try and do that. They'll go, I'm going to throw it all in and I'm really good this first week, second week, a little bit off and then they just blow out. Yeah. Um, I would suggest to make small changes over time and you're much more likely to go, oh, this is just a part of my lifestyle now and you know, it's taken eight weeks to supplement something else into my diet that um, I don't usually eat and it's a bit more healthy but now I'm doing that more regularly. That, that's a win. That's a huge win. Yeah. You know, it's funny. It's... Oh, I probably enjoyed myself a little bit too much <laughs> post marathon. I, I well, that day I lost. I've, I've said it to a few people. I was six kilos that yeah. day. A lot of that would so, have been probably water weight. Well, just, just water well, right? weight, right? Yeah. But like I lose triple the salt due to my CF. Like, yeah. I lose a lot yeah, of right. salt, That's and really interesting. so I I salt loaded. Yeah, and I had a lot of salt on the day. Yeah, the one Still thing that Benny way. pulled me up on probably mid race was he's like, mate, I think you've had almost too much electrolyte not much yeah not enough just water yeah i was just pumping the power rays and he said yeah. i think you're probably flushing yourself out yeah, a bit yeah. too much and the minute i changed that i felt a little bit better but yeah. i and i say i lost like six kilos like you said it would have been all been water or a lot of it anyways and i looked dry after the event like i looked yeah, like right. i was dying yeah, like, yeah. Well, I was for part of it there for about two Ks <laughs> at the end or a couple more. But I ate so much food that next couple of days. Yeah. And it's like it didn't put a dent in the A. Yeah, yeah. I mean, your body's going, um, and, and we're really great at adapting. So our body's going, what's just happened? Um, yeah. Let's account for that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and that, that's kind of natural. It's that kind of, it's that concept of intuitive eating where you go, oh, my body is craving food at the moment and I've just smashed myself doing a, doing a marathon. So, let your body have that, you know. The one thing I'm really looking forward to is getting back in the long run Wednesdays because it was a ritual to go long run Wednesday straight into Chico's for lunch. Yeah, mad. And those <laughs> chips are so good, eh? I spent my fair share of time at Chico's. Down <laughs> Mate, I remember, I recall a story. All, I've told all the boys this. I used to come home from every long run and I had a pair of the Recovery Lab boots. Mm. Mate, I honestly, I cannot swear by them yeah rate them anymore i rate them so much because obviously benny's a part of that company yeah and benny said hey you should get a pair and just see how they go mm. sent them down and he was raving about them and yeah i was like i was i was kind of hopeful but didn't know what to expect yeah I and them. for someone who had gone from like no running mm. to training for a marrow and doing like there were periods there where for like six, eight weeks in a row, I'd done like 20Ks on a Wednesday or 15 mm. or 25Ks. Yeah. Mate, they were like miracle workers. Yeah. I had one massage the whole prep, the yeah, whole right. five months. Yeah. And like, I couldn't believe it. Right? Yeah. I thought they were great. Yeah. And there was one day I come back from a 30K and I was so defeated. I ran with a mate and just mentally defeating myself the whole way. We probably, we'd done a different route. We ran around the uni, yeah, yeah. like Botanic Gardens, there's a bit of elevation. Yeah. <laughs> hills around there. I was just like, fuck, I forgot how hilly this place is. Yeah, yeah. And I got back and I was I was rooted after 30Ks and I'd only had like one slice of avo and Vegemite toast that yeah, morning. Right. I was hanging for it and I had half a gel. Yeah. What an idiot, right? <laughs> what an idiot. Because, because I was... I'm kind of pre-diabetic where I used to yeah. have diabetes yeah, because yeah. of my CF. I don't often respond that well to sugar early yeah, right. in the day. Yeah. But you forget when, you, when you're when you burning that many calories, you're yeah. just absorbing it like that anyways. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But I got home and I had a, like a large snitty burger from Chico's and a large Mad. chips. Mad. I salted it up big time. I got home, put my recovery lab boots on. And just and I got heaven. two bites into the burger and I woke up an hour later, it was sitting on my chest. How good. And my hand was still in the chips <laughs> with those boots on it. And I swear I couldn't walk when I got home and I got up and I could walk. Sweet. And You're I was like, like, those boots are miracle workers yeah. and I ate that cold burger. How good. So, just so the fairies good. came that, that afternoon. Oh, mate. Sort of <laughs> mate, it's so good. Yeah. So good. So Chico's in recovery lab. That's a go-to <laughs> post-event or post-big run. But... How much run, like I know obviously you're running heaps, you're doing a lot of stuff, probably on the bike and swimming too when you're preparing for these tries. How much time are you spending in the weights room? Uh, I would say that in terms of for myself, probably um, at least once or twice a week um, yeah. when, when I'm in a good little block there um, at least. And I would say that endurance athletes, 
uh, probably don't uh, value gym based work enough, right? Yeah. And and it kind of shows um, it kind of shows in terms of uh, kind of core stability and things like that, like swimming and cycling and, and running as well. Like they all use um, a lot of that that core stability, right? And uh, and yeah, e- even you know. Um, Heavy, heavier kind of leg work for for longer runs. People go, oh, I'm an endurance athlete or something, so I'll you know I'll just lift light and um, just do a, a bunch of reps, right? But um, yeah, I mean, I was talking to um, Paddy from the running room, which is up in in Coogee there, and um, and yeah, so he was he was saying that the research suggests that um, people should be getting those heavier sessions in 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 the gym, and that really does benefit um, endurance running as well. So um, there is a lot of benefit in the gym that probably people don't um, realise when they are doing those longer distance events. Um, they go, oh, I would, I would almost suggest to supplement if you're if you're training say six days a week or five days a week and it's all endurance based, all out on the road, um, to supplement one of those sessions with a gym session is probably going to help you out. I love it, and I think it's something that Benny and I spoke about a bit, a bit throughout my training and me getting back in the gym. I reckon they help big time, especially oh, around sure. my joints and just strength, strengthening and mobilizing yeah, things. Yeah. I felt good for it. So. Yeah, and I mean, you don't realize how good you you would feel because like, you can't you can't put yourself against yourself at the same point in time, yeah. either trained or untrained, right? So yeah. it's, um, you kind of, you might be mid-race or mid- midway through a long run and you go, fuck, I'm feeling good. Um, yeah. and, and you don't know what, what has caused that. So it's... Uh, it's about finding those little those little things that really work. Those one percenters, you know, the boots, the massage guns, the the gym sessions, all those things that add up to go. I'm feeling really good in my training at the moment. I love it. Far out. We've covered a bit today. We're just shy of that hour, <laughs> so I'm gonna wrap it up. There's only so much that you can remember when it comes to this stuff. So hopefully your brain's taken on a good amount of info, some stuff that you can apply to your training, your life, whatever you're prepping for, or whether you're just prepping to get some energy and get into the office and get behind the laptop for the day in your training session in the afternoon. Whatever it is, nutrition is a big part of your life. Um, I think as you've said on one of those other podcasts, you know, if you're eating three meals a day, you should probably know something about nutrition and mm. I think it's very true. So a lot of stuff that I'm going to take away from this today and apply it into my life. Um, mate, pumped to see your business grow. Give everything a shout out. Where can people find you? Where's yeah. the best place to get in contact? Yeah, so I mean, if anything's um, struck a chord today, and and hopefully, you know, people people do get some value out of those simple messages. But um, there is a lot more to dive into, and if any of that has um, struck a chord, I mean, I've I've just started um, a business at the start of this year, just just to help people out with those nutrition chats, right, to open up more conversations. So, um, yeah, if people feel the desire to to kind of reach out, then um, yeah, just start it up with the website Chapo Health and Nutrition, and um, and yeah just on on socials as well so feel free to reach out and hopefully i can help out a bit you know the deal all the links will be in the show notes the instagram handles the bits and bobs so you know where to go to get the information to get the good stuff um if you're watching this the camera just exhausted on us for the last five minutes of this pod so there'll probably be a nice still photo of our mugs for you to look at (laughs) in the last two minutes or so of this podcast but as always appreciate you all tuning in it's always a pleasure you know the drill give it a subscribe a follow a five star rating and a raving review it's how we grow share it with one two three however many friends tell your mum at the dinner table whatever you got to do to help us spread the good word spread the gospel um it's well appreciated chapo absolute pleasure mate thanks Um, for the invite mate mate it's, it's a pleasure and like i said it's always good to sit here with people who are far smarter than me in their topical field of choice and mate keen to see you rip in and do some great things with this business yeah cheers mate legend see you later thank you